Thank you very much. I'm in a bit of a difficult position, really. You've had two absolutely excellent speakers, two profoundly moving speakers, actually. Uh, I've heard them before, uh, and yet I'm still kind of swayed emotionally by some of the things that they're saying. And I suppose that's one of the reasons why I went into the theme of research that I took up uh, some 18 years ago now when I made the transition from mainly clinical practice into 100% academia uh, and decided that this was what I was going to look at. Uh, so 18 years ago, um, I started looking at what I initially called difficult, non-compliant and unpopular psychiatric patients, which was a bit of a pejorative term. Uh, and then quick, that quickly morphed as I read the literature and got to grips with the subject to thinking about conflict and containment, conflict being potentially harmful events and containment being all of the things that we do to prevent harm. The interesting things about all of these uh, items that you can see up on the screen here is that they correlate together, they travel together. So a patient, for example, who is aggressive is also more likely to abscond from the ward and is also more likely to refuse medication. Uh, a patient who is subject to coerced intramuscular medication is more likely to be secluded and to be manually restrained. But the same thing goes for wards. So there are wards that have high rates of aggression. Uh, they also have high rates of absconding and high rates of rule breaking and high rates of the use of drugs and alcohol. There are wards that use a lot of manual restraint. And those wards that use a lot of manual restraint don't use less of other things. They use more of those other things as well. Uh, and what I found right at the outset of my research 18 years ago uh, was a fact that's been reiterated by Joy and by Paul this morning, is that there are vast differences between wards and between hospitals. So there are some hospitals and some wards taking the same sorts of patients. In fact, you can have two wards right next door to each other taking the same sorts of patients, operating the same sorts of services, and one of those wards can have 10, 20 times as much conflict and containment as can the one next door. And those are, incidentally, that conflict and containment doesn't always travel together because you can have wards that have extremely high rates of containment and low rates of conflict and wards that have it the other way around as well, as well as having wards that have high rates of both and wards that have low rates of both. All that these figures are demonstrating is that there is scope for change. There are things that we can do that can reduce the rates of uh, conflict and containment on our wards. And that's what my research program has been all about. Uh, and I'm going to take you on a little whistle-stop tour of a few of the findings that relate specifically to manual restraint before I go on to tell you about the Safe Ward study and the intervention that we've found that will actually reduce uh, the rates of conflict and containment. Uh, so off we go. First study that I want to draw your attention to was the City 1 to 8 study where we looked at 136 acute psychiatric wards over a period of six months each and we collected their shift by shift rates of conflict and containment and we wanted to know what was associated with high rates of conflict and containment on wards. Was it the attitude of staff? Was it the physical environment? Uh, was it the numbers of staff? Was it the numbers of doctors? All of these things we were, we were looking at. Uh, what we found about manual restraint was, was that on average across the system in 2005 on acute psychiatric wards, restraint was used once every five days. Uh, but just as Paul has said in his figures, um, criticised though they might be by some, that ranged from very nearly zero on some acute psychiatric wards to very high numbers on others. So you know that's a big sample, six months on a ward, and that's a big comparison that happened all at the same time using research validated tools, and there really is this variation in the rates of use of manual restraint. Now the use of manual restraint was associated with the proportion of patients who were subject to legal detention on those wards. Two rates of aggressive behaviours, it's not as if you use a lot of manual restraint on a ward and suddenly the aggression goes down because it's so effective. No, you get the two going up together and it's associated with the enforcement of treatment and detention. So it's uh, associated with 
forcing people to take medication and forcing people to stay on the wards. I will add a little bit of uh, note of caution to the proceedings of your conferences. You can't totally eradicate manual restraint while at the, still at the same time having a mental health act which means that the pro we, the professional staff, can compel people to accept treatment and compel them to stay on the ward. Because then if they try and leave the ward, we will physically stop them, and that's restraint. And sometimes, when legally authorised, we will compel them to accept treatment that they don't want to have, and that will also re uh, result in a manual restraint. Nevertheless, nevertheless, despite those big realities of the system and of, uh, of psychiatric care, those vast disparities in the rates are indicating that there is scope for change. Uh, greater doctor availability was associated with less use. Actually, more ethnic minority staff on the ward was associated with less use of manual restraint whilst controlling for all other things, but there was a no association of patient ethnicity with the use of manual restraint. And an effective structure of ward rules and routines was associated with less use. And that was something that I was honing in on very quickly as being an important aspect of those wards that had low rates of conflict and containment. Uh, just to uh, 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 whet your appetite, this was our longitudinal study, the Tompkins Acute Ward Study, where we followed up 16 wards for five years, uh, and we looked at the training records. So we looked at who from which wards went on what was called in that trust prevention and management of violence and aggression training. And we also had access to all of the official incident reports. Uh, and what we found was, very interestingly, when you send your staff away from the ward to go on a five-day course, aggression on the ward goes up. Uh, so there's something about having a stable staff that patients know that is important, an important mechanism in reducing rates of aggression. But the other important thing that led to a change in this trust was that when people went on their one-day updates once a year, uh, when they came back, violence in and restraint increased slightly rather than decreased. And when we investigated why that was, it was because the refreshers were all about the physical skills of manual restraint and not about refreshing people's de-escalation skills. And that changed uh, after this piece of research. Uh, conflict and containment sequence. We were looking at the sequence of different conflict and containment events for 522 randomly selected patients. As you can see there, what that told us was that 13% of those patients experienced restraint in the first two weeks of their stay in hospital. Now, that did surprise me. I had no idea, really, that it was going to be that much. If you look at rates, you see, if you look at rates one way, once every five days, it doesn't sound too much. But when you look at it from an individual patient's point of view, one in 10 patients being restrained during the first two weeks of their stay, then that looks high. Once again, there were vast disparities. There were even bigger disparities, I would say, in this study in the use of seclusion. Uh, there were some hospitals that used no seclusion at all, about a quarter of hospitals. Uh, and then there are some hospitals that ranged right up to, to hospitals that were secluding at nearly 25% of patients during the first two weeks of their stay. And unless we start counting these things rigorously and compare them as MIND has campaigned for, and as is in positive and safe, then those places that are using an excess of seclusion and an excess of restraint will never know. They'll never look in the mirror and say, because everybody thinks what they're doing is normal practice, and you can go on any ward in the country, and they will tell you, we never restrain somebody unless it's a last resort. And yet they all have very different rates of using these things. So physical violence, the most frequent precursor of manual restraint, uh, followed by less severe violence, that would be uh, verbal abuse and aggression to objects, but also medication refusal and attempted absconding, affirming again, some of manual restraint is about the compulsion of detention and treatment. What happens uh, after the restraint is most commonly medication, either uh, semi-voluntary in the case of oral PRN medication, or actually compulsory medication in the, in the case of IM medication. And sometimes, one out of 10 times, the restraint ends and nothing else happens afterwards with no further containment action, but 10% of people end up on special observation. And one in 20 people, if you look on average across this uh, sample, ended up in seclusion following a manual restraint. Just a little taster, we've been looking at the RIDORS data. Uh, that uh, belongs to the Health and Safety Executive. 
and this is about injuries happening to nurses as a result of physical violence. Uh, and they are only injuries where it, that necessitate the nurses or staff taking uh, at least uh, three to five days or more uh, off sick following the incident. So these are the more severe, the, the more serious incidents. There is about 700 of these a year. So 700 staff are injured during violent altercations with patients over the course of a year in the NHS mental health system in the UK. Restraint is dangerous for nurses as well as it is for patients. It's the biggest single context within which nurses get injured during a violent incident. So 25% of nursing injuries due to violence occur during a restraint incident and they occur during the initial struggle when trying to get hold of somebody and the nurses are thrown around, sometimes violently, into items of furniture or to the ground or people trip over because there's a kind of a, a malaise. This is, this is not really a very well-controlled circumstance when you're actually trying to get hold of somebody who is actively uh, resisting. Then the second most common circumstance is when people manage to break free from the restraint and assault the people who have been restraining them. And the third most common circumstance is when everything appears to have calmed down and the nurses release the patient from restraint and the patient then gets up and starts attacking them again. So all of those circumstances have to be borne in mind when we're thinking about the recommendations for shortening restraint. How it, the full results of this NPNR data, which is uh, uh, this uh, HC data, which is being analysed by Leisha Rennick, will be presented at the NPNR conference in the autumn, and after that there will be a publication and you'll all get your hands on it and be able to, uh, uh, to look at it. So that's part of the context is nurses are being injured, but to put the obverse side of that, the other co context of that is nurses don't die when they're manually restraining patients. During this uh, 18 months of data collection, there were no deaths of professional staff in psychiatry. Uh, and I've said this frequently at conferences before, and I'll say it again here, even though we get injured as nurses in the course of doing restraint, who should be more scared of who? Should we be more scared of the patients or should they be more scared of us? And I think that's something we need to bear in mind. So I'm going to talk to you quickly about the Safe Wars model. It came out of that program of research. It came out of us looking at the whole of the previous research literature on all conflict and containment items. That's over a 1,000 research studies. Uh, and it took 14 people over a number of years to get through all of that material. No one person can deal with that quantity of information. And then it was about thinking and ordering and synthesizing that material. <coughs> And this is the Safe Wards model in its simple form. We've identified six features or originating domains, six, six aspects of psychiatry and the operation of inpatient psychiatry that can give rise to potential flashpoints. Those flashpoints may give rise to conflict, and that conflict might be connected with a containment incident. And you'll see there's a double arrow between conflict and containment there because the use of containment albeit preventively, can sometimes stimulate the conflict that you're trying to stop in the first place. And you see there we've identified a whole series of points at which we, the staff, can modify those processes. We can alter the originating domains, cut the connections here, there, and everywhere, decide not to use the containment in the first place. And what is more, there are things that patients themselves can do in order to cut those connections and promote a safer environment for themselves and for each other. And there are ways in which the staff can influence what the patients do with each other so as to accomplish that. Uh, I can't get into those six domains because I'm running out of time. All I can say to you is this is a very complicated state of affairs. There is no single easy answer. There's a lot of determinants over rates of conflict and containment on wards. But helpfully here are all of the flashpoints and all of the staff modifiers identified. And I'll tell you where you can download this online in a minute. So we use that model to generate a lot of ideas for interventions that we could use to reduce rates of conflict and containment on wards. We went out and checked those ideas out with panels of service users, carers, uh, and with expert nurses. 
We piloted 16 of them in one hospital to see how they actually wor worked out. We got down to a short list of 10 interventions, and we took those to a full uh, cluster randomized control trial in the early part of 2013. Uh, I want to tell you quickly what those interventions were. Clear Mutual Expectations was asking the staff on the ward to sit down with the patients and agree what their expectations of each other's behaviour was, to codify those in a set of uh, mutual expectations, and those posters were hung on the wall and used in the patient induction to the ward, also for the induction of new staff uh, and temporary staff on the ward. Soft words was a set of about um, 80 or 90 little statements about how best to handle the common uh, flashpoint situations of nurses having to say no to patients, nurses having to tell patients not to do something that they want to do, and nurses having to tell patients to stop doing something that they do want to do. So we had a set of these 80 statements that suggested different ways in which those situations could be managed, and those were changed and hung in the office on a, on a regular basis. Talkdown was a model of de-escalation. The wards elected their top de-escalator, and that person took the rest of the staff through the de-escalation model one by one, conveying his expertise and what he made of the model and the range of suggestions in that model. Some wards used that as a, a debriefing tool to look at what they had not hadn't done after an incident had occurred. Others used it in role play and other education um, uh, opportunities. Positive words was the requirement to say something good and positive about patients at the handover, whatever else you say. Uh, and our service user and carer group came up with a long list of things that staff might like to draw each other's attention to. Uh, bad news mitigation was about horizon scanning for bad news that patients might get uh, and uh, dealing with that rather than letting patients stew uh, and get angry and act out. Uh, mutual help meeting was a meeting for uh, patients to sit down and devise ways to help each other, small things they could do for each other. Uh, know each other was a folder of innocuous information about patients and staff, each on a single sheet that was left out in the day room, that would provide things like what people's favourite soap opera was, what their favourite film was, what sort of music they liked to listen to, this sort of thing, that would uh, humanise patients in the eyes of staff and vice versa, but also would also provide topics for normal everyday conversation between patients and patients and between patients and staff. Uh, calm down methods was a box of alternative equipment. Um, we had some iPods in there with soothing music, uh, blankets, stress toys, uh, light uh, displays and the like that could be used as an alternative to PRN medication when people were becoming agitated. Uh, reassurance was about uh, dealing with the ward community after there had been a, fright an, a frightening incident. Not a frightening incident to staff, a frightening incident to patient. Patients, those two things are very different. Put yourself in the patient's shoes. There are actually quite a lot of frightening events on wards that the staff don't, don't uh, realise are happening. Uh, and discharge messages was about patients leaving the ward, leaving some positive message about their stay there for future patients to look at. But a control intervention as well. Uh, here's some pictures. That was a postcard that we handed out as part of the soft words intervention about things to think about when saying no. Uh, these were some of the mutual expectations posters that were developed during the pilot. Uh, on the left-hand side there is a know each other folder. Uh, on the right-hand side is a discharge messages tree. Lots of wards have adopted this idea of having it as a tree uh, with messages from patients on the, on the leaves. There is a, a ward, a unit in North Wales actually, that has one not just on the psychiatric intensive care unit, uh, but also at the unit entrance, and I believe people from all over North Wales come to look at it. Professionals, because the professionals very rarely get any kind of affirmation about uh, the way people value inpatient care. That's the de-escalation model. You can see it on a poster on the wall. Uh, that's one of the soft words interventions hanging on the office wall. That's the calm down uh, methods box. So we went out and we tried this in a big trial. 15 randomly chosen hospitals. Uh, we ended up with 31 wards in the study. Uh, half of them did that experimental intervention, half of them did a control intervention, which was based around improving the physical health of staff. Uh, we had all of these measures, collected some baseline data, then people implemented the interventions and we collected the outcome data. This is the headline. 
On the experimental wards, conflict decreased just under 15%, and containment decreased even on an even larger basis by 24%. That's very nearly a quarter decrease in the rate of containment, and that includes manual restraint. So we had a very, very good outcome, and we proved, as well as it is possible to prove with current experimental technology, that this really does work. So now we're trying to get it out there and share it with everybody, which is why I'm here. So we have a YouTube channel, and there's a little video about each of those 10 interventions that you can use. Actually, since that time that I, I took that screenshot, there are now several videos from nurses and managers who've actually implemented the interventions and have left their advice behind. Uh, and I was shooting more videos yesterday uh, between me and other people, uh, summarizing some advice on how best to implement this how to deal with resistance, the standard of the evidence that lies behind the model and behind the, uh, the actual experiment itself and so on. We're on Twitter too, but we don't have anywhere near as many followers as Paul. Maybe you can follow us, Paul, and we'll accumulate a few. Um, we have a Facebook group which proves, uh, is proving extremely popular with inpatient nurses. Lots of inpatient nurses seem to use uh, Facebook. Uh, and in fact, we always post photographs of the presentations that we make. So I'm going to photograph you lot now. If you don't want to appear on Facebook, just stick your head down now. So that's one lot of you. And this is all of you in the middle. I'd take a panorama shot if I could trust myself to actually do it effectively. Uh, and this is our main website, www.safewards.net. This is where you can find everything. You can find the model there, all of the explanations, uh, instructions on how best to implement safe wards, um, guidance and checklists on what to think about and what you need to accumulate and what order to do things in. Uh, those little videos, again, and full explanations of the 10 interventions. Uh, and there's also a website forum there so people can share expertise on the implementation of safe wards. So 17 mental health trusts so far have made a commitment to implement safe wards across their acute wards and other areas. And we've had contact with a total of 37 mental health trusts. We've got international reach. So there's a set of organizations in German-speaking countries who've come up with the DOSH to translate uh, our website. That, that is now been translated, and they're running their final checks on that, and I would expect that to go up and be live within about four weeks' time. And the state of Victoria in Australia has set aside two million Australian dollars for safe wards implementation and evaluation across the state. So give you some idea of the kind of international reach. These are the kinds of things that staff say about it. Here's uh, a collation of what staff said uh, in Norfolk. After a safe wards presentation, this was collated by a member of staff there. So they say things like, it's been a real buzz on the ward. I think people really get it. Uh, this could potentially flip everything on its head and make things much better. Um, I feel a little bit excited by the evidence which shows it works. I hope members of my team recognize this. It's common sense and it makes you think about what you do and how that help, helps and so on. Uh, the, some of those people who work on wards that are not ready at the moment to implement safe wards because they're involved in a range of other interventions say things like this. They say, uh, I myself have incorporated the interventions into every aspect of my nursing care and the results are fantastic. So you don't need anybody else to implement safe wards. You can look at your own practice. If some of you are trainers, then you can look at your own training and think about how you might in, uh, input safe wards into that training. And if you're clinicians, you can think about how to input it into your clinical practice. And if you're managers, I dare say, you might want to think about how you could implement this into your management and into your supervision of your more junior staff. So summary, we've got a brand new large-scale explanatory model that explains those vast differences which have been discovered between wards in their rates of conflict and containment, including those differences in rates of manual restraint. So we've generated interventions from that model, and uh, the RCT has had a positive outcome, so we're recommending that you implement these. They're not difficult. 
They do take some forethought and they do take some planning and it will take you a little while. The eight weeks that we tried during the trial was probably a bit too short, but they're not difficult and they don't cost money. It would cost about £600 per ward to do this. You don't need to send anybody away on any training course because all the stuff is available online and wards can sit down and plan how to do it themselves. Lots of resources to help you. Uh, I've been through some of those already. Uh, so I'm inviting you to join the forum and to join uh, the rest of us who are implementing safe wards across the UK. Thank you very much.